invite uh, all of you here in person and on Zoom uh, this afternoon. I'm welcoming you on behalf of the Scoville Memorial Library, who's hosting us here and the uh, Historical Society of the uh, Salisbury Association. I'm Richard Reifsnyder, the current chair of the Historical Society. I'm glad you found your way in here. When I saw and I realized we were gonna be competing with a major concert across the road here, I thought, oh gosh, parking's gonna be a problem, but obviously you found your way to park somewhere. So mm -hmm. we're delighted that you're here. Uh, it's, uh, it's my great delight to be able to uh, introduce uh, Tim Benson as our speaker. Uh, when I first moved back to uh, Salisbury and was getting interested in local history, I asked, I think it probably was you, Lou, or maybe it was your, your mother-in-law, um, you know, how I could learn a little more about the, the Native American history of the area. And immediately I was told that I needed to read the Tim Benson's thesis uh, on uh, Mohican lands and colonial corners, Wetog, uh, Wekwadnich, and the Connecticut colony. Uh, Tim's thesis. And I did uh, much to my great, uh, great interest in benefit. And I thought immediately how good it would be to try to get uh, Tim here uh, to speak on this topic. This was at the outset of COVID, however. And uh, so it's taken some time until we could get him because we really wanted to be able to be in person as well as, as doing it on Zoom. So Tim grew up in this area. Um, his mother still lives here. I think she's sitting in the back there. So it's good to see you uh, there. And uh, so I'm sure you know he explored these lands uh, you know, during the growing up, uh, growing up years. I understand, incidentally, that our town historian, Jean McMillan, I mean Porter McMillan, was your sixth grade teacher. She she's joining us by Zoom today. Yes. And uh, I'm sure that she introduced you to the world of history. So she's going to be checking you out today. <laughs> How well you do. Right. So anyway, but Tim has certainly continued his interest in indigenous peoples by conducting archaeological investigations in the Northeast states and part of the West. A number of these have been published. And professionally, Tim serves as the regional tribal liaison for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Association. So Tim's talk, excuse me, Tim's talk is on the Native American heritage of the Salisbury area. Tim, it's really good to have you here. Welcome, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Rich, and uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for coming out today on such a beautiful day. I, uh, to see all the, the interest in this topic. And um, I, uh, as, as uh, Rich mentioned, um, I, I serve um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as um, a regional uh, tribal liaison um, for the Northeast and South, Southeast regions. And so um, I, uh, I live in Amherst, Massachusetts, and I work, um, I work out of the um, Fish and Wildlife Service's Northeast Regional Office, which is in Padley. Massachusetts. And um, my role is to uh, basically advise the federal agency that I work for, Federal Land Management Agency, on, um, on uh, relations with, with the tribal nations and uh, the trust responsibility that the federal government has and um, that has practices for consultation with, with the tribes. And so um, this is a very, uh, it's a dynamic time um, to, to be in this role for me. Uh, because the, uh, the Biden administration has put a um, kind of an unprecedented emphasis on enhancing and improving relations between the government and tribal nations across the country. And um, Secretary Deb Holland, Secretary, she's the first Native American Secretary of the Interior. So um, there's uh, a lot of um, renewed emphasis on, on um, fostering these uh, relationships and improving relationships with tribal nations. And so <clears throat> during this time, I, I've had, um, I, I frequently have um, occasion to think about the, the threads of my personal and professional life that have kind of converged, put me in this um, sort of special um, space uh, professionally at this time. And um, some of those threads uh, lead back here to, uh, to Salisbury and my interest in the, um, the Native American heritage here. Uh, and so what I'd like to do today, I don't have a, um, I don't have a slideshow, I don't have a PowerPoint. I think we may have all had enough PowerPoints to do that recent time. Um, so I'm gonna just um, hope to have this as a you know, conversation. And um, I'm gonna share some uh, personal history 
and which will um, illustrate how um, how it led into my learning about um, not only uh, Native American culture in general, but specifically um, here here in Salisbury. So I'll, I'll be sharing some of what I've learned um, today. And um, then I look forward to your, your questions. And so, um, and feel free to interrupt me at any time if, if you have any questions as we go. But um, as, uh, as Rich mentioned, I, I grew up here in, in Salisbury. I uh, went to um, Salisbury Central School for um, uh, kindergarten through eighth grade. So I'm a supporter. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and so we learned a lot about the, uh, you know, the, the founding of the town, the founding of Salisbury and a lot of the history, the iron, iron industry um, and the, you know, the sort of incorporation of the town in 1740, 1741. And um, so, yeah, there was a lot of emphasis on the iron industry and the revolution, which is all very important. But um, I also spent a lot of time as a kid um, on, uh, on the Houstonic River, and on Mount, Mount Raga and sort of in the woods, you know, around uh, our family, we, we moved several times, but always within town. So we lived in Falls Village and then Lime Rock and then over on Indian Mountain Road. And then um, my parents, um, when I was in college, they, they bought a home in, uh, <laughs> in um, on Metog Road, the north part of town. And so I was always struck by the, uh, the number of uh, Native American place names, you know, the, the sort of Eastern Algonquian names that we're all, you know, familiar with here in town. And um, like, uh, you know, the brook outside here, Wachacastano and uh, Metoc in the Northern part of town and Mitalanchu, which is the, the mountain when you're driving up, you know, towards Smith Hill, up where it's all for school. And um, they, they went on Scapoma, and one on Lake Jean and um, and other other uh, others of these place names. So I was always curious, you know, sort of what had what had happened to the Native Americans who were, obviously there were you know a lot of Native there's a large Native American heritage here in town, and um, so I, was, I had that curiosity about you know what had what had happened um, what had happened to them, you know, what had happened during that time. And um, so that question was always was always with me, and there was a sense of um, the others were kind of curious about it, but it wasn't something that um, it was sort of like it was a connotation of something you know untoward or sad that happened at that time. Um, so I uh, um, so I, I always had that question in my mind, and um, then I went to the, the Hotchkiss School. And um, after graduating, I went to uh, Connecticut College down in, in uh, New London. And um, I thought when I started college that I would be an English major, but I wound up taking some courses in uh, social and cultural anthropology. And those, uh, I got increasingly interested in, in anthropology. And um, I had a, uh, um, a visiting professor. We had a visiting professor um, who, uh, this was in the mid the mid 80s and um, uh, a gentleman named uh, Kevin McBride and he he was uh, is an archaeologist and he also taught at a uh, University of Connecticut but he was a visiting professor in um, in, um, in archaeology at Connecticut College and so um, I I was uh, very I took several courses with him and learning about the archaeology of, of Native Americans and in southern New England, and uh, sort of uh, you know different methodologies that were uh, applied to identify Native American archaeological sites, and I was I was uh, something about that uh, that clicked for me. There's a predictive model where um, to to identify locations that have a higher likelihood of having um, Native American archaeological sites in them, and um, it's, it's based on, um, you know, proximity to, to rivers, wetlands, freshwater sources, you know, level ground, uh, well-drained soils um, next to uh, travel routes or different resource areas. So it's kind of common sense, um, but it was, um, 
it, it, that really um, that really fascinated me. And um, so I wound up um, uh, being an anthropology major, and um, it was significant for me that um, I had met uh, Kevin McBride at that time. And the uh, because he would be when I returned to grad school, he was he was my he would be my advisor. Um, and then um, something else happened around that time that, that uh, my parents um, bought a house on Weedsod Road, and they were um, this is when I was still in college, and uh, they um, they were putting on an addition to the house. And so at one point, this is during the summertime. There was a um, in the, the property is it's it's right near the uh, Houstonic River in this sort of nice rolling floodplain um, area um, on a knoll near the river, and um, so this uh, my my younger brother and I were uh, were at the house, and um, this uh, gentleman stopped in. Um, he had seen the uh, tobacco and the um, <clears throat> large. Um, earthen pile where the foundation holds and uh, and um he was uh, um, an archaeologist named um russ hansman russell hansman and he um he had seen as i would later learn that you know archaeologists have, have a fascination for this sort of thing they, he, see, he saw this big earthen pile and he wanted to come down and see what the, the soil profile was like and so um <clears throat> so he um basically russ uh he worked for the um, what was then the um, American Indian Archaeological Institute, and it's now um, the Institute for um, American Indian Studies in Washington, Connecticut. Really fascinating place. Some um, really good resource um, for um, for more information about you know indigenous culture and heritage in this area. Um, I would recommend a visit. Um, but Russ, um, he basically uh, dedicated the rest well the entire afternoon to a sort of impromptu. Um, uh, I wouldn't call it a lecture, just sort of a, a discourse about <laughs> the geology, the archaeology, the Native American heritage of, of the area. And, um, you know, it was like, you see those, uh, you know, in the soil profile in this big deep pit, you can see these different sand layers. And it's like, that was, uh, you know, because there was a, a post-glacial lake here, you know, uh, you know, Lake Falls Village, you know, a, a river from the falls, the Great Falls. And so I was like, you know, there's a glacial lake here, and he's like, he described how the by the river, there's sort of the benches, that, you know, that were formed by um by floods, you know, historically, um, and there were some rocks, you know, up by Utah Road, there were these limestone rock, bedrock outcrop that's was sort of water worn. And he's like, how do you think that got you know water worn like that? Um, <clears throat> it was because you know the waters at one time were much higher, and so um, but he also talked about the the Native American archaeological heritage in the area. And so that sort of um, got planted in my mind um, that uh, one was like, wow, that's, you can do archaeology as a profession. You know, that's, that's pretty cool. But it also um, gave me a, um, a sense of uh, that there's the world we see here. Uh, um, and, but then just below the surface, you know, sort of literally and figuratively, there's this other world, um, this other dimension of a more ancient past that is uh, awaits discovery and interpretation. And so, um, and also learning about the, uh, not only the, there's the question of the, the Native Americans who lived here, you know, in the colonial period and historic period, but, you know, there, there's evidence you know, archaeological evidence of um, many thousands of years of Native American settlement here in the town, here in Can Canaan, Litchfield County. Um, there are many, many um, archaeological sites that are, you know, extremely old, you know, all time periods, you know, 500 years old, 1,000 years old, 5,000 years old, um, even older, 8,000, 10,000 years old. Uh, so it's, uh, there's a lot to, there's a lot to, <laughs> there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to know. The, the archaeological record is very complex. And so, um, after I graduated from college, I um, I went to um, I wanted to you know do something with my major, so to speak, anthropology, archaeology. But I also wanted to go out west and go on a road trip. And so, 
Um, the idea that came to me of um, an archaeological field school. And um, <clears throat> so I went to uh, ar archaeological field school in somewhere completely different, Idaho State University. Um, and um, that was a that was a that was a great experience. Um, that uh, um, it was uh, in, in a in a uh, on the, the middle fork of the Salmon River in, in sort of central Idaho, and it's it's uh, sort of near. Um, if you've ever been out there, sort of later near north of Ketchum, Sun Valley. Um, it's the largest, or at least it was then, it was the largest unpopulated area in the continental U.S. Um, so it was, it was a total wilderness area. Um, and um, and we just found some amazing, amazing things archaeologically. Um, thousands of years of evidence of thousands of years of Native American seasonal settlement at this um, sort of waterfall rapids that was there. Um, so that kind of got the uh, my real interest in in archaeology. And so um, after uh, and it was it was funny at, at the field school there were people. It was as if I'd come from another planet. For the people of Idaho, they were like, you know, you came you came all the way from Connecticut to come to our field school, and I was like, you're kidding me. This is the most beautiful place I've ever seen. And they're like, yeah, I feel like you know mountains and rocks and trees. <laughs> So, um, but that kind of got the sort of, I got kind of hooked on archaeology at that time. So I worked out there a little bit um, professionally. And then I moved to um, to uh, Boston with friends after, after friends from college lived, lived in uh, Boston for two years. And I worked um, professionally in archaeology in, um, for Boston University. At, at that time, they had a... Um, is a form of archaeology. It's called uh, public archaeology or contract archaeology, and it's it's um it's the most common form of archaeology in the United States. But it's it's um it's for uh, compliance with um, the National Historic Preservation Act in Section 106. And certain projects, construction, development that has a, a federal nexus or federal funding or a federal permit, they have to comply with National Historic Preservation Act, and so. Consultants are needed to go out and do archaeological archaeological survey work. Um, so I did that um, for a couple of years in mostly in southern New England and working out of Boston. And then um, I moved to New Mexico for four years. And so again, <laughs> it's a very different environment, but I'm doing uh, doing archaeology out there. Um, and along the way, I had numerous opportunities or experiences to, to collaborate with or work with or consult with um, tribes, tri tribal nations in, in uh, New England and in, um, in Idaho and in uh, New Mexico. And so um, that was a very uh, important um, aspect of my, of my experience. Um, and so, after working in uh, New Mexico for four years, um, and I've got a lot of stories about that for another time, but um, I went back to the grad graduate school at, uh, at University of Connecticut. And um, that is, uh, um, and Kevin McBride, who I described earlier, um, he, was, he was my advisor. And um, he, Kevin was, um, in addition to being, Professor at University of Connecticut he was also the um, archaeologist for the Mashantucket Pequot tribe, um, tribal nation in southeastern Connecticut. And he had been involved in their um, uh, efforts and research to when they, for, um, when they got federal recognition in 1983. Um, and when I had taken courses with Kevin uh, at Connecticut College, he had described his work. His archaeological work with with the um, with the tribe with the Mashantucket Pequots, and I just remember thinking that um, not only was archaeology in itself you know quite fascinating, but to be able to to do it for um, you know for a partnership with a tribe would be particularly rewarding. Um, and so so then I was uh, so I was back at a uh, graduate school for and. Um, I came back. I was doing um, archaeology, archaeological research, um, but the 
that question from from childhood was still in my mind about um, the uh, the native people of the Salisbury area of this part of the state, and so um, I that's what I decided to do my my master's thesis on was to explore that that very question, and so um, there was not uh, there wasn't very much had been compiled about that question. So I um, I did, there were some, but around that time, interestingly, there was um, a, a, a small group of, um, of researchers who were looking into, um, looking into that question, not, not just of this specific area, but of like the Hudson, you know, the Hudson River Valley, Western Massachusetts, Northwestern Connecticut, um, and um, and sort of uh, leading efforts to reconnect, to connect with the descendant communities of the people who live in this area. And so that, um, but a lot of my um, uh, research for my thesis was, it was original research um, and, you know, pulling together from whatever source of information I could about um, the, uh, the Native heritage here in Salisbury and Sharon. Um, and so uh, what I learned, <laughs> well, I started out with, you know, I learned that there were, um, I was focusing on the, the period, um, the colonial period between um, 1675, you know, King Philip's War period and the, the founding of Salisbury and Sharon around 1740. Um, and because that was at some time of uh, transition, you could say between, um, it's hard to imagine now, but um, as late as the 1730s, the Connecticut colony, they had essentially no idea what, what was here, and what is now Salisbury um, in terms of, uh, you know, they, they didn't know anything about the area at all, really. Uh, and in fact, um, so you had this in sort of indigenous homeland in what is now the tri-state area, and then these sort of geopolitical arbitrary boundaries were kind of imposed, sort of bisected and dissected that that uh, that homeland. You know, the sort of the boundaries between uh, you know New York colonies and New York, Massachusetts Bay, and Connecticut, and so. Um, it was not, uh, there's not a lot of clarity about for any given location on the landscape around here, you know, which colony was it in. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, you know, there's confusion among the, uh, the colonists and there was, uh, and you had the native people who were obviously increasingly aware that things are changing very quickly and that um, forces is way beyond their control were, were being imposed on them and they're going to be um, changing their way of life, impacting it in a major way. Um, so my, uh, my research, I, um, I found that in, um, in Salisbury, the primary um, uh, community was uh, Weetog. Um, and that they lived um, sort of on the northern end of uh, Weetog Road near Bartholomew's Cobble up at that time. Um, and which coincidentally or not coincidentally was just south of the, the colonial border between, because you, you know, the Massachusetts Connecticut boundary runs right south of Bartholomew's Cobble. So they were right next to that, uh, that, um, that border and not far from the New York border as well. And in um, and in Sharon, what would become Sharon was the Wabadnock community, and they were by the um, uh, lake uh, there. And so um, I, I I had to do some original research to to find out you know what had what had happened, and um, so it involved uh, the um, there was some. Um, the, uh, the deep research, um, one of the most interesting experiences I had doing that research was that um, 
the uh, Connecticut, the state archives have, um, it's called the, uh, they're called the Indian papers. And um, I think until the 19th century, um, each town in Connecticut, sort of in their town records, they would have the, the collected sort of deeds and other um, documents related to the uh, the Native Americans who lived there or who had lived there. But at some point, um, the state consolidated them all in the state archives. And so um, the, uh, but most of them had not been transcribed before. And, and certainly the ones from Salisbury and Sharon had not been transcribed before. Um, they were out there. But, well, I was like, they, they, um, they hadn't been published anywhere. So I was like, um, I need to look at these and see what's <laughs> see what's in them. And um, so I went to the, um, I was at the Connecticut State Archives in Hartford and uh, they had at that time, this would have been sort of the mid nineties. They had uh, they had them on microfilm. They had two sets of microfilms that had these, um, the deeds on them, the Connecticut Indian papers. And it would be like, I would have to go to like Salisbury and Sharon and find the right real, that sort of thing. But um, the day or one of the days I was there, uh, the, the archivist was like, um, well, we we went out both sets of the microfilms. We're not supposed to do that. Um, we don't have uh, um, so the so you you get to look at the original documents. I was like, oh, okay, this sounds cool. So I was in this sort of side room in this sort of art, you know, sort of archival room. I was given these sort of like white lab gloves and with a big oak table, and um, the archivist brought in couple of large, very large leather bound volumes, big, heavy volumes. And um, they, uh, he's like, here you go, you know. Um, so I found myself with these, these huge volumes and um, they were, they were, they were sort of matted, so to speak, because like the, all of these documents, you know, they go back to like the 1600s, the mid 1600s, um, 1700s. And um, so the paper was almost like, the form of textile. And so they were matted so you wouldn't be touching the actual you know, document itself. And so I was just able to kind of turn these pages and leaf through them. And they were uh, in um, these sort of handwritten documents, deeds, statements. You know, and some of them were signed by, you know, um, Mohegan and, and Pequot sachems of, you know, the, the mid 1600s to the late 1600s. And you know, to be like sealing wax, sort of still hanging, you know, clinging to the pages. And so, um, so that was just absolutely fascinating. But then I was able to go to the, the, um, the documents from, uh, from Salisbury and Sharon and transcribe those. And so um, there was, uh, there was a lot of, um, well, there was, you know, definitely some, some insights into those. Um, the, uh, but the native people, um, they were not, they were often sort of ignored or not included in the, um, the colonial documentary records because the colonial towns, they would have, you know, vital records of births and deaths and probate and all that sort of thing. They would capture the, uh, you know, the colonists, particularly the, the men, but, um, the, the native people, you know, their their communities and their lives were not captured in those types of records, um, and um, so I was able to. And then there were um, some uh, um, Moravian journals for a very brief time, right around it's just what amazing timing, um, right around the time, the late 1730s, early 1740s, when Salisbury and Sharon were being incorporated. Um, there were uh, Moravian missionaries who lived among uh, at Waquadnock and also um, at Weetog, or at least visited Weetog. And so they, they kept very um, vivid journals. And so we have this brief but very vivid um, set of, uh, of journals describing, you know, the Native people around here, you know, their names um, and um, 
how they lived, where they lived. So there was a lot of um, valuable details there that I was able to incorporate into my thesis. And so um, the uh, so basically um, they uh, the, the, they um, they were they, they were self-identified as um, as Mohicans um, here in um, in Salisbury. Um, the, uh, the 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 um, the, Mahican, the traditional Mohican homeland, you know, around the time of contact period in in the 1600s was in um, the Mahakanitak or the um, Hudson River, <laughs> um, and um, the uh, but they uh, around um, the 1730s they uh, there was a sort of a movement. A westward um, movement into what is now um, southern Berkshire County and northwestern Connecticut, um, and so they were uh, they were Mohicans, um, although they they certainly had um, you know relationships with um, the Scatico people of the um, of um, the middle and lower Housatonic, um, in, you know in the Kent what is now Kent. Um, so the, uh, they, um, basically, uh, they, there, there were, um, there was confusion, it's a nice word for it, um, among the colonists about, you know, what, what is now Salisbury? Uh, there were there were Dutch uh, settlers who who believed that it was in um, it was part of New York, and um, they had um, relationships with the uh, the uh, the Mohicans, the native people of Weetag and um, and and of Wapanak as well. Um, and they uh, the Dutch had more of a tradition of um, of uh, you know, maybe more accommodation or living alongside the indigenous people than, um, than the English did. The English was more like sort of, um, they were to be either, uh, you know, removed or destroyed or completely um, converted to Christianity or assimilated. Um, and so uh, the the people of Wittag and Wapadanak were, um, they became aware that the Connecticut colony was looking to um, establish new townships in this area. And in the 1730s, um, uh, Connecticut colony sent uh, some scouts, surveyors to ch to check out the area and see what would the, what, you know what were the what were the lakes like? What was the was would the land be good for farming? Um, and you know, sort of you know. Early early industries for the, the river the streams and water courses that sort of thing, um, and so uh, what uh, what played out here was so my, my thesis was basically like you can either do a sort of you know regional synthesis of the patterns of you know colonialization and what happened to the native people, or you can um, you can look at a Sort of more specific, very localized area a case study, um, which is what I did. They kind of gave a very local illustration of these bigger processes that, that played out. Um, and so um, my all that all that information is in my um, my my thesis, which is uh, available I think here at the library <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have PDFs of it, um, but um, that um, that summarizes, you know, the bigger picture and, and all the details about um, the uh, the native people of this of, of this area. Um, and um, so, you know, what what happened to them? Um, some of them uh, joined. Um, well, there's a lot of different things happened, but basically there was a, um, a diaspora effect where 
they joined eventually um, other other communities um, to the north um, and also um, there were uh, um, re uh, relocations uh, westward um, removals basically of the um, of, of the native people uh, and so um, uh, Stockbridge, Stockbridge, Mass. Um, you may you may know this, but it was originally um, intended to be a uh, Native American town for the Mohicans, and um, it was laid out um, the long main street there by the, the Red Lion Inn. Um, there were all of these uh, long narrow properties on either side of the of that main street that were all um, you know for uh, Mohican people. Um, and today, if you, if you um, next time you visit Stockbridge, if you turn left at the red line and you can go to, out a mile down on the left, there is a, um, it's a monument. It's a 19th century stone monument um, to the Mohicans, the, um, the friends of our fathers. And it was like, a, it's an ancient burial place of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of some of those ancestors. But um, the uh, what I what I learned one of, perhaps the most important thing I learned is that the um, the uh, you can we, we can still um, connect and and speak with um, the descendants of of um, the Mohicans of this of this area um, the uh, Stockbridge Muncie community Mohican Nation. Stockbridge Muncie community. Um, they're a federally recognized uh, tribal nation and they live now in um, northern Wisconsin after a series of westward re relocations and removals during the, during the 19th century, early 20th century. And um, this was um, about 22 years ago, but I was fortunate to, to, to go to, um, they had a, uh, um, a history conference, a Mohican history conference in, in um, at their reservation in northern Wisconsin. And so I was able to to go and um, present a paper there. And I got to meet some direct descendants of like the Sachems, the, the tribal leaders of um, of the 1730s and 1740s, um, Conca Potman and Pachini, meet their um, descendants and um, uh, yeah, people who have um, who had not, you know, visited their ancestral homelands here, or, um, but in the last couple of decades, there's been increasing efforts to um, the expression um, I like is uh, is mending the hoop, that the hoop was broken, and that um, any efforts to to help um, today's descendant community um, reconnect with the ancestral homelands is a form of mending the hoop, and so. Um, the, uh, so in Stockbridge, uh, there's been a lot of efforts to do that, um, and um, tribal uh, groups will visit and you know get to um, yeah to revisit their ancestral homelands. And so there's been a lot of good efforts, I think, to to reconnect today's uh, living descendants. Um, so um, I uh, I have some. Uh, <clears throat> Some suggested reading, <laughs> if you will, um, for, for more information and details. Um, well, there's my um, my thesis, which uh, which you can make available, like on PDF version, or it's here at the library as well. Yeah. Um, if you want to send a PDF, I can put it on our website. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can do that. Um, and then uh, Lucy Ann Lavin's uh, Connecticut's Indigenous Peoples. It's a uh, it's it's a relatively new book, um, and I would recommend it. It's like a it's an authoritative summary about um, indigenous culture um, historically and today in in Connecticut. So it's a really good source. Um, this book, when I was doing my um, uh, master's research. Um, 
surely done. Uh, the Mohicans and their land, 1609 to 1730. And she, she has a second book as well. But um, both of these books are just, there's an incredible amount of information in here and, and many, excuse me, many references to this area, Salisbury, Sharon, um, Southern Berkshire County. It's just um, a very rich and vivid um, descriptions of what, of how the native people live around here. Um, Specific to, uh, to Stockbridge, there's uh, Patrick Frazier's The Beacons of Stockbridge. Again, um, also contains you know multiple references to the native people of this area. They're very closely related, and um, so this is also a good a good source for details about this this area. And uh, finally, a more general overview: Kathleen Bragdon's uh, Native People of Southern New England provides a really good um, summary of you know, a larger part of the region, the, the, the life ways of, of uh, the native people um, around, around here and, and in Southern New England as well. So um, those would be, uh, those are some definitely recommended sources for further, further inquiry. So um, that, uh, that's a basic summary, but um, I, I uh, appreciate you all coming out and I would welcome any questions. We have a question in the chat too, if we want to start oh, with sure. that. Yeah. Want. Um, Gloria asked, have you had a chance to study midden pits or samples or discover other physical examples of Native American inhabitants in our area? Um, not, uh, well, specifically middens, are uh, like shell middens are, well, maybe, did she say shell middens or just- She middens? just said midden. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah um, middens are are um, basically areas of, uh, of ref refuse <laughs> where um, the, uh, whatever um, people discarded. Um, and so in, in coastal areas and like, you know, in New England, there was a lot, they, they had people consumed a lot of shellfish, so there, there would be uh, these very thick deposits of, of shell, which um, uh, preserve uh, organic materials really well. So the so shell midden sites are, um, are a very special uh, type of archaeological site. Um, but she may be referring to this more general um, uh, Native American habitation areas in this in this area. And so, there are, um, I haven't done archeological research specific. I've done a lot of, I've worked on, over the years, I've worked on a lot of archeological projects in, in Southern New England and beyond, um, but not specifically in uh, Salisbury and Sharon. However, um, I've seen artifacts. Um, I've seen many artifacts um, you know, from this area, we had an event here at the library. It was quite a, quite a while ago, but um, people were invited to bring in, um, you know, do you have a Native American artifact or something you think might be a Native American artifact and bring it in and we can, um, <clears throat> you know, ideally we can, you know, if it's, if it's real, we can record the location on the landscape where they found it. Because in archaeology, context is everything. Mm -hmm. um, if you have... Uh, have an artifact, it can be very interesting, but if you don't know where it came from, its context, you can't learn um, much from it. But if we can, you know, if we can date it, and then we can know where it was on the landscape, we can kind of reconstruct settlement systems as they existed, you know, 500 years ago or 5,000 years ago, based on where those sites tend to be located. So, Yes. The name Kevin McFly um, sounds very familiar to me. And I'm wondering if maybe he's the one who led the group that came out when I used to own the farm uh, on Indian Cave Road, which is now more of a farm. <clears throat> and they, they did a dig there. Hmm. And because it overlooked the more broken and everything. And apparently, the farmland used to be an island. Oh, wow. 
the um, anyway. Yeah, I have some artifacts that could bring me. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, the, yeah. Um, or you, excuse me, or you can email me, you know, pictures. You know, that, mm -hmm. that kind of thing would be useful. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'd have to check with Kevin if he's ever worked in, in this part of the state. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if the people of this area participated in the King Philip War. Um, <clears throat> it's a great question. Um, there, uh, yeah, King Philip's War or Metacom's Rebellion, 1675 to 1677, and it was the it was an effort to um, basically uh, <clears throat> drive out or drive back the um, European colonial frontier. Um, and at this time, this was this area was way beyond the colonial frontier of that time, which was still, you know, fairly close to coastal areas. Um, but there was a um, an incident during King Philip's War um, in what is now Great Barrington, Monoctico, Great Barrington, um, uh, where some colonial forces pursued some native forces and there were some fatalities at a crossing point in Great Barrington. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a while since I looked at that, but there was, that was the, the, the nearest <coughs> King Philip's War related event that I'm aware of to here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Can you say a little more about the different approach that the, the Dutch settlers had working out developing contracts with the Native mm -hmm. Americans and the English approach to that and how it connected maybe to the we talk communities understanding of land and property and ownership mm -hmm. and all those kinds of kinds of issues. Right. Yeah, yeah that's a, a great question. Very complex question. But the uh, the Dutch had their government <clears throat> in Europe had had actually um, <clears throat> debated whether you know the Native American people in North America, you know, whether they had souls or <laughs> or or rights, uh, and um, they their policy, I guess you'd say, was more at least relatively respectful of the indigenous peoples' uh, rights, um, and. Um, you know, the English was more like, uh, you know, these people, you know, may not have had, had souls at all. So, which rationalized, you know, the, what they what they did for them. They can, you know, if they're not if they're not humans, they have no rights, and they. they but they, but both communities start to develop treaties or or develop. Be, you know, do things legally yes. somehow, right? I mean, that was right. They were right. They had some sense you, you you couldn't just take the land. You had to work out a, a yeah. deal. Or, yeah. Well, I mean, is that true? I mean, I'm I'm just um, yeah. The uh, hmm. the, the there seemed to be a greater sort of combination of coexistence between um, like in, in this area. Um, in the 1720s and 1730s, with the people we taught, the native people and the Dutch settlers, small number of Dutch settlers that were in the area, they I think they would they would trade with one another, but they were kind of coexisting. Um, and they kind of had a, a workable relationship. But then um, when the Mohicans became aware that uh, Connecticut colony was saying, no, these lands are within Connecticut. Um, and we're going to establish these townships here. Um, the, uh, the Native people were kind of outraged by that because they're like, wait, we had our relationship and our um, agreements with New York, mm -hmm. you know, forces to be in, in uh, New York. And so um, they were having to and that's what was always interesting for me was that their their native homeland uh, was bisected divided up by the by the three colonies right in this area and so 
both Weetog in the 1730s, both Weetog and Wakadnock, they they live right on for intercolonial boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, my my thinking was that um that was not entirely a coincidence because there would be um say there would be some, you know, Connecticut colony would say, um, because of our, you know, relationships with native people, you know, they're they can be arrested on site. Mm -hmm. You know, would it be advantageous to be able to just go, you know, a quarter of a mile and you're in administratively, you're within, you're not in that colony anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of also, it's it's kind of equidistant from, roughly equidistant from Hartford, from Springfield, and from Albany, mm -hmm. the sort of colonial uh, administrative hubs, I guess you'd say. Um, it's another interesting aspect of this area. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they were very um, kind of complex dynamics. But yeah, the, uh, um, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the people in Wapadna, the native people, they, they, um, you know, they, they were, had some very sophisticated responses to this process that was happening. They, they retained an attorney and they made their appeals to the, you know, Connecticut government. Mm -hmm. And um, so they tried to sort of, you know, work within the colonial system, so to speak, to defend their, their rights, their sovereignty. So that's a great question, but that's, you know, we could, yeah. Yeah, we could have a whole <laughs> seminar about that. There are a couple more. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I, I know you last one. <laughs> Excuse me. That's one that's a little bit, but the, um, the like the Sharon settlement, was my understanding is that yeah. primarily a seasonal village. So what does the archaeology of a seasonal village look like? I mean, are you looking for, those poles and, and like field systems, or or is it a stockade, or what? What are you actually looking for? Well, that's a great question. Um, yeah, seasonal. The, there was the the traditional native way of life. It did follow a seasonal um, a seasonal round of different uh, you know re, re, different resources, different um, you know it would be uh, it could be plantings, it could be different types of animals. Um, Fish and um, so the and there's evidence from those uh, journals about the um, people uh, native people seasonally moving their houses. They had um, in, in this in in this area they would have Algonquian people had um, leetus, which are sort of uh, dome shaped uh, dwellings, wooden wooden frame dwellings. You know, covered in bark, and um, but they were able to um, move these, you know, seasonally if they wanted to, you know, on a local basis. Um, but they, um, the uh, the Moravian missionaries described them moving them to, you know, early spring, moving them to um, the sugar swamp, as they called it, but basically the maple, the sugar maple groves. Um, and then, um, yeah, depending on the season, there would be, you know, different um, activities and different locations that people would go to. But to get to your question of what, what do we look for archaeologically, um, there are, uh, well, a lot of times it's, it's uh, lithic artifacts, stone artifacts. Um, uh, People call them arrowheads, but technically they're projectile points. Very few of what people call arrowheads are true arrowheads from bows and arrows. Um, mostly they were they were different types of spear points, and um, so archaeologists have you know have a chronology of different styles of different types of spear points uh, and pottery, pottery styles too. We know you know their approximate age, so that. Um, uh, so if I see a, a spear point of a certain projectile point of a certain shape or, or design or style, I can be like, oh, that's that, that type is like five hundred to seven, like five thousand to seven thousand years old, whereas this other kind is that's, tends to be about eight hundred years old. Um, so but there's a wide range. Material culture is very wide range of artifact types that that we see, but also we do see. Um, you mentioned post. Well, post molds, 
basically those are um, <clears throat> when um, they were the native people were building their structures, they would um, have sharpened uh, tree trees, um, saplings sometimes, or, or you know trees like maybe that 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 far in diameter, and they would. Um, the ends would be sharpened and then be driven into, into the ground, into the subsoil. And then they would, they would have rows of these or circles of these, and then they would bend them over and tie them together at the top to create their, their dome like structure. Um, but archaeologically, you can see um, if, you, uh, if you know what to look for, when you, you're kind of traveling away in the subsoil, you'll see these dark surfaces. <laughs> patterns of dark circles in the lighter colored subsoil. And then if you open up a broad enough area and you can see the patterns where they, where they are. So, oh yeah, you, you, do, you do see those sometimes here in, in, in this area, but um, a lot of agricultural activity over the years has, you know, the upper, that part of the upper part of the soil has been Kind of turned over, so um, there's not a lot of locations where those types of features are are preserved. But thanks for the question. Yeah. Okay. We yeah, want, yeah, can we do, do another one? The from, there's, a there's a couple more in chat, but I'll do the first one then, um, we'll if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, did the Mohegans get any reparations for land in the northeast corner, namely Stockbridge or Salisbury? That's the first. Um. Oh, at, at the time, like with land transactions during the colonial period, um, uh, I mean, essentially no. I mean, some of the some of the deeds were just basically a sort of a a formality um, that the colonial representatives would would they would find someone who you know they said represented the tribe as a whole, and they would get their signature on it. But it was basically a sort of a, uh, a bureaucratic exercise. That, and as far as um, was it, did it say reparations? It said um, yeah, or, reparations, reparations for land. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as far and since the colonial period, no, okay. um, nothing. No, they 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 never got um, you know anything like what we would consider appropriate compensation for the land it was taken. Yeah. Best guess, um, what would be at the largest the community numbers? <laughs> we're talking 50, we're talking 150. We're talking oh, the population? 50. Yeah, population um, wise. And I have that's a great question. question after that. Yeah, it would, it would totally um, depend on you know the time period. Right. But at the, the largest. Um, Probably, well, the uh, it's complete. This is total speculation. Mm -hmm. I get but that. like around 1740, 1739, 1740, when Salisbury was being incorporated, um, I would say there was one description of um, a Weetog containing 40, 40 huts in a cluster. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say. You know, um, perhaps um, 100 to 200 people. Wow. Um, which sounds, may not sound like a lot, but, um, you know, okay, considering there were no, you know, the colonies, you know, their, their populations were very small right. and, and, you know, kind of consolidated at that time too. So, um, but that's, that's a, that's quite a conjecture on my part, but. I understand that. Also, a little different, on the Weetog Road, there's a very interesting wood carving. Are you responsible for that? <laughs> um, where, where on Weetog Road? No. Oh, oh, oh yeah. um, I can tell yes. you about that. Um, <laughs> no, that, that's uh, our neighbor, my, you know, my mom's neighbor. It's not ancient. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that. Did you do it, Gail? No, I'm not. Close to my neighbor, uh, a tree was 
a stone gun on her corner of Utah Road, uh, across the road, and uh, she was uh, devastated because of this beautiful old maple tree, um, or rather young maple tree. So somebody came by and said, we can carve the fallen tree into a figure and fix it to the stump. Mm -hmm. um, so she said, great. <laughs> and she didn't know what they were going to produce. Uh, people will say to me on the road, oh, we love your Indian carving. But actually, it's a samurai. Which is, I think, the picture <laughs> carving. But well worth the drive down there if you haven't seen oh, it. Yeah, it's very it's fun. Very, very impressive. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. But it is, it is interesting to drive to the north and, and um, northern part of Weetalk Road and around that Bartholomew's Cobble area and, and think about that that was where the, you know, the locality where that settlement was at that yeah. time when, when, when Salisbury was incorporated. Yeah. Uh, the people who lived in that settlement, did they end up in the uh, area in Wisconsin where the group in Massachusetts? Um, no. That it's a great question. Um, I can't. Uh, I I can't say um, definitively that those specific excuse me specific people did um, was in that group that eventually um, is in Wisconsin today. But um, it would make sense that they that they uh, that they were. Because I think that um, there's a close relationship between the people of Weetog and um, the people of uh, Winoxicook up in um, Stockbridge. And so it would be kind of logical that they would join their, rel their relatives there and that they would have been in that group that was um, several decades later um, had that the westward removals. What was the removal? What was it? Oh, well, um, sort of starting in the uh, 1780s. 1780s. After the, yeah, there were a number of um, Club Mohicans in Stockbridge who served in the Continental Army. Um, and so it was after that time that the removals began, but those like to you know, New York and Pennsylvania. And, Eventually, to when we speak of the removals, uh, what government governmental entity was involved in making that happen? Was that something within our community, or this is essentially being done by state forces or colonial forces? Yeah, it would have been um, state by that time. It would have been state forces that uh, and the government. States and the federal government, um, sort of, um, these people would be okay. They were being, you know, removed. There's no longer a place for them in their ancestral homelands. But they would be um, offered a location to the west, where where you know colonization was minimal, colonial settlement was minimal. But then there was just that westward progression of of um, where they would be removed from that location further to the west, and their their lands would be taken, and then they would have another location that they could go to, and then the process would kind of repeat itself um, all the time. But um, <clears throat> during the, the whole during this series of multiple re removals, um, there would be uh, census information of these groups. And so that that's how they can trace their ancestry. You know, today's you know Stockbridge Monsey community, they can look at those records and they know that their ancestors were where their ancestors were at those different points of time. And so that enables them to um, also demonstrate that continuity of of, uh, of leadership and ancestry today. And so today they're federally recognized. Right, in Wisconsin, but they have, you know, obviously they have interests in their ancestral homeland. So, yeah. 
question. There's one more question on the okay. chat if yeah. you want to do that. Um, Victoria asked, do you know of any research done to document direct actions by families of local European descent that took place to diminish the local native population or drive the first people off their land? Perhaps old newspaper articles or letters, et cetera, that shed a light on specific incidents? Hmm. That's a good question. <clears throat> I think um, you can, uh, in, um, you, you, you can look at a, like, you can look at those early deeds in Salisbury and Sharon, and you can see who the European signatories were, and you could you could link those to, you know, vital records within the town. Um, but uh, I I haven't done that, but yeah, you could you could theoretically do that. Um, but uh, the um, there was one ironic thing in um, in, uh, in my thesis research, which, which was that uh, in Sharon there were all of these uh, in the 1740s. There were all of these. Uh, uh, there were a lot of deeds in Sharon, and all, um, a lot of uh, the, the settlers sort of angling to get the lands from the. Uh, sort of competing to to get the lands from from the tribe, um, which they ultimately succeeded in doing. But there was like you know a lot of controversy and protests from the tribe. But then um, in the uh, within um, a couple generations, all, all those families in Sharon or those colonial men, they they didn't have any descendants. Those, those their lines kind of died out after all that sort of effort, you could say. Mm -hmm. um, so, in other words, um, I'm not aware of any you know, descendants today who are directly descended from um, people who, you know, got those native lands in the first place. Is there one more question, maybe? Yeah. Oh. What is the name? Monastropoma mean in Lake Monastropoma, do you know? I, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I did. Yeah. Uh, although that, that, that you mentioned it, an interesting thing about this area also is that um, there are certain places in southern New England that have a very high rate, you could say, of retention of Algonquian place names. And the sort of tri state area here and Salisbury and Sharon is one of those places. And um, I, which is interesting. There are so many of those because every all of these. Uh, I mean, every mountain and stream at one time had a Algonquian name, name. But some of those have been preserved. Some of them we'll never know. Um, but it's also it's, it's interesting to think that there are they're all unique. Um, in, in Connecticut, for example, with, with a very few exceptions. Well, there is in Simsbury, there's a locality called Weetog as well. Um, but, but in general, um, here, there's only one Willimantic person. And so people in their minds, you know, that would have had, they would have been able to associate that very specific place name with that place. And so, because um, you, you just think of the mental cartography of maps, information they would have had in their minds. That they all would have learned in terms of traveling around, um, but no, I don't. I don't. I would like to know. The, uh, since you raised that, just to let you know, the Salisbury Association is right now putting together an exhibit that they're calling "What's in a Name." And we're going to do exactly that sort of thing, not only some of the street names, but some of the Native American names. So, you know, look where it might have come. Yeah, I think it's uh, July fifteenth. Yeah, it's scheduled July. mid July. It's scheduled to be in the Academy Building. So. Stay tuned. And I think, yeah, we should let you have the last word since the last, last question that you had. Oh, thank you. I, I just wanted to mention the fact that when Tim was um, working on his thesis, he gave me some translations from the Moravian 
uh, they have the Moravian missionaries who did come here to um, uh, Chicago and Milton um, to help the native people. That was what they were sent from Moravia to do. Um, they uh, wrote a journal every day. They had to write it up a journal. And they were here for a year or two, and then they went back to Bethlehem in Pennsylvania, their headquarters, and took the journals with them. And recently, the um, Native Americans from the uh, southern Connecticut have been able to afford to have it translated. And Tim lent me a heap of these papers um, while he was working. <laughs> and I found them totally fascinating and totally heartbreaking because the uh, missionaries had to describe how they were helping the native families move to Pennsylvania, where William Penn had given them a huge amount of land because we have a huge amount of land. So they would transfer them family by family or part of family, separating the family, sending the mothers and children maybe down the river the Hudson. Um, so it, they, it, that has now been published as a book. I, I, I think it's a paper that book, right? And um, if you find it in the library, it's probably in the library, um, do read it because it gives you the intimate details of what went on. And I found myself quite shocked uh, about the way the settlers treated the, the natives. There was some very interesting stories in there about them going into um, Catholic, Congregational Church in Salisbury mm -hmm. one day. And I mean, because they were traveling up to uh, a big meeting in Stockbridge. Then, um, so I recommend that. Um, and I also want to tell you that the other day I was driving from Milliton to Salisbury and then up to uh, towards uh, Great Barrington. And I thought as I went past the lake, this is such a winding road, clear cloud path. Then I thought, no, wait a minute, that's English cloud path. <laughs> um, they would have, this would have been as it winds around the lake and it keeps on bending. You know, lots of roads in this area bend. Um, they must have been native footpaths. Yeah. And they went from miles and miles and miles. I mean, militant to Great Barrington to Stockton, it's quite a long walk. But they did it every year to get it together. Um, isn't that right? <laughs> yeah, most of yeah, most of most of um the main roads like state roads like Route 44, they are or a large parts of them, they will fall, they evolved from you know ancient Native American trails. Yeah. Weren't most of them deer trails originally? Um deer trails. Mm -hmm. Um many, many Native American paths were initially deer trails. Yeah, yeah. The so Peach Tree Road in Atlanta mm -hmm. was originally a deer path. Well, listen, to, I mean, thank you so much for uh, you giving us a lot of And I'm sure that Tim would be happy to have you take a look at the books that he has up there. And, uh, thank you all for coming. So, Thank <laughs> you.